I don't know. I guess people have assistants, but I don't know how you would do it as a single person. So our whole practice is all about the two of us, our physical space. We'll get to the current situation, but we purposely sit next to each other about eight inches apart and we can always see each other's screens. Yeah, that's my chair over there. So we can always see each other's screens. So we have sort of this collaborative workflow where no matter who's actually, you know, pushing the mouse around, we're both working on this, working on the projects together. Do you want to add anything to that, Tom? Not yet. It was good. It was cool. Uh, our our situation is a little bit different. Um, I think Todd and Lucian they try to like overlap so that uh, you know they can do one person can do everything that the other one can, um, and uh, we're we're a little bit more. Uh, we have overlap. Richard and I, it's probably like you know uh, seventy thirty, like seventy percent of the tasks we we uh, do together, and we both uh, uh, you know both can do. And then about 30% of the tasks uh, we split up. So Richard does all the web development. I don't touch it, thank God. And um, uh, I, I handle the print stuff and uh, phone calls and that kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, just trying to fill in each other's strengths and weaknesses and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're pretty much always creatively involved on every project at the same time. So it's just like the production part where we kind of did the tests out. How about in terms of client contact, like for each of your practices, is there one of you who that sort of defaults to, you know, kind of the, that Yeah, Rich, that Richard have? can't answer phones uh, very well. Uh, he can, he's just not good <laughs> at it. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, I, I was immediately the, the, you know, the guy that answered the phone to do that, that side of the client contact. Um, and, uh, and then once we get in the swing of things, then, um, you know, it's not like uh, I do all the client contact, but yeah, I'm, I'm the first, I'm always the first point of contact. And uh, yeah, what's it like for you guys? We split it up. Uh, like we chat about it as things come in and we decide who's going to take it. Um, and then we kind of go with vibe, right? Like who, who it feels better for to follow up with. Depending Wait, on so Lucian, Lucian answers phone calls? Well, let's be real. We don't get I a lot answer of emails. Yeah, we don't get a lot of <laughs> these days. But um, yeah, we split it up like today, you know, and then we we juggle client communication a lot, kind of tactically. Like sometimes I lead it, and then Lucian comes in to support, or Lucian leads it, and I come in to support. Very rarely, the only one of us, our only one of us, the point of contact through a project. But sometimes that happens. I'd say ten percent of the time. Normally, if it's yeah. first contact with a potential new client, we try our best to both be on that phone call or on that video so that they sort of, they meet both of us at the same time. So yeah. we, we found that to be pretty important. And anytime we present anything, we present in tandem. Yeah, I was curious about that, about the presentation part of it. How about you guys? Okay. Yeah, we're always both there. Johnny will lead the discussion usually um, I'll, I'll be taking more notes and then kind of filling in the gaps you know if you know it's hard to remember like every little point of justification or every possible thing we wanted to talk about so it's it's good for like some one of the you know like to have that checks and balances and have that other person be able and to everyone know. every once in a while a client will ask a question and it'll be like just throw me off guard and i'll be like uh and then uh, richard will jump in to, yeah <laughs> Especially if it's about like uh, project management or legal issues or that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, one thing that people might find interesting is that Johnny and I, um, we always have each other's Gmail open in a tab. Um, so we like, even if we're like one of us has taken the lead on communicating on certain projects, um, we kind of can keep keep up to date on like what um, what what's going on. Like we used to share one inbox. And that's kind of where it stemmed from and it got uh it got like too hard to do that but um but yeah we can always write emails from each other and we'll oftentimes um depending on like let's say johnny's the point of contact for something um the main point of contact um, but he's too busy to write a response i'll write it up from him and then he'll go in and just like 
add some like sarcasm into it and then send it. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's kind of nice just being like a duo and being this close and being able to like, after many, many years, be able to write from their voice like pretty well. Um, and it works surprisingly well. That's interesting. We do something kind of similar. Like we mostly handle our own emails and don't really discuss unless it's like sticky or change in scope, change in money, um, something hairy. And then we'll, you know, now that we're not together, we'll slack draft emails back and forth until they're dialed. And then one of us will, will ship it out. But usually it's just a conversation because we're sitting a few inches apart. We see, see each other on 99% of emails. Yeah, same, same. There's certain things like, uh, just like, like there's certain duties we split out where if people, people ask us about eco questions, like students and stuff like that. And it's pretty much always, we know that's Johnny's job. And then um, if people ask about hiring, um, I have like, you know, my, my canned messages that I can like readily access and then like kind of tweak based on their circumstance and that kind of thing so um, yeah, like i want to yeah, take like, a, all the, like, a uh, quiz that's an email from johnny but it's two emails and one of them's actually from richard and see if i can <laughs> figure it out yeah if it's from cast a cast iron account it'll be pretty similar because we have we try to kind of have a somewhat uniform voice so. from our personal accounts you can probably tell I would say we confuse people on Instagram DMs because we both, we share a single account and we freely message and reply and we never say which of us is talking. And sometimes it can get a bit confusing for people. I always know, I always know who it is. <laughs> we, we have a, a lot of peers overseas though that we don't know like personally and they think like Burger Fair is a person. So they're like, <laughs> yeah, bro, or like, Way to go, man, you know, uh, but you know, that works, it's cool. Yeah, we always try to do two emojis, which signifies the two of us. That's so cute. Is it the two people holding hands? <laughs> or hugging, yeah. Yes. So what are some of the greatest, I'd say, what would you say is the greatest challenge and what is the greatest benefit of being, of practicing as a duo? I, I can take this unless someone wants to hit it. Go, Go for ahead. it. <clears throat> um, so I think we don't have a lot of challenges and our challenges, I would like to believe we largely turn into opportunities, but you know, we're, when we're putting out any of our artwork or things that are off brief, there's some subjectivity involved, which we tend to easily rule out in our client work just based on our process and methodology and philosophy. So while I think it's hugely beneficial to one's own personal development and creative practice, other people could see it as a hindrance, but we share everything as we're iterating on it, even if it's a project that one of us is leading more independently. So there's a constant feedback cycle. And you know, sometimes you think you have something super dope and you nailed it and then your partner's like, ah, it's kind of fucked up. Uh, you know, and, and so you've got to like process that iteratively. We do a lot of that, like, and, and that's even trickier remote. Like this weekend, we're working on a series of posters to submit to a, uh, a book in a, uh, online exhibition in Australia, a series of, po of protest posters for, for climate change, protesting climate change. And so we were producing a series of posters, making a lot of micro adjustments and, while it's an opportunity, it takes time. It can be challenging. If you were just one person sitting alone, you miss out on that feedback cycle and arguably the opportunity to make the work better, but you can also maybe move faster. Uh, so I think that's a challenge, but kind of a, a winning challenge. And then uh, everything else is just upside, especially when you have someone else that you can depend on and rely on to like pick up the pieces or do the work that you can't do that day or don't want to do or aren't in the mood to do or reach out to a client that you're frustrated with and it's not the time for you to do it or it's fucking tax time. You got to split up like talking to the CPAs, the bookkeepers, you know, track down documents. Like there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that kind of sucks. And I think being a duo or having at least the, you know, close to 50, 50 partner to help carry that load is super valuable. And then when you both want to just be doing creative work all the time, 
it's nice to be in that situation with another person because there's empathy towards like how much the shit you don't want to do sucks. So you can share that load and, and divide and conquer. So that's, that's another component I really like. Mm -hmm. Richard, what do you think about that for your practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Todd. It's, it's 90% uh, bonus, like positive, constructive things, having, having another person to rely on. I mean, you ever wish like there's just a second version of you that could help you out with your like household responsibilities and, and just right. like kind of like you know a, a critique what you're doing and help you improve and all that and it's um, working really closely with one specific person it's kind of uh, it's kind of like that but they also have their own point of view that they can they can bring to the table too so um, so yeah it's mostly good I think you know sometimes there's some challenges I think a lot of the times it's a third party kind of uh, uh, if we're disagreeing on something it's because of how we uh, how we interpret what the client is asking for or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll feel like one of us will feel like we're kind of caught in the middle trying to like find some compromise between what, you know, what your partner's vision is and what the client's vision is. Um, and it's a challenge. Uh, and I think most of the time, if you take the time to work through it and rather than um, discounting one person's side, finding a compromise that it, it almost always leads to a better solution than, than you were, you, the first two options were to begin with. Mm -hmm. That, Richard, you hit on an interesting point. I just want to like kind of double down on like, uh, you know, we all tend to think we're pretty clear communicators. And so when two people are having a conversation, for the most part, most things are understood. But when it gets into someone buying creative work, uh, some of the language, particularly coming out of the client can get a little fuzzy. And, and we don't necessarily always know the, how they're interpreting our language, which there's some technical nuance to, but we try to tone it down and make it as lay as possible. So having another person's perspective on like, hey, I think they really got this or they didn't get this or they're thinking this or they misinterpreted that, et cetera, is super valuable. And, and sometimes, you know, playing psychologist and mind reader by yourself, I have to imagine could be really tricky. It's, it's a conversation we have a lot, like seemed like they're over here and then it's like, no, I, I thought they were over here. And, let's discuss what the middle looks like, or maybe I'm just fucking wrong and I misheard or misunderstood and we are over there. So we spend quite a bit of time just like reading between the lines as a team, which is super helpful. Yeah. Just, yeah, uh, I think yesterday, uh, Richard got an email from a client and he was like, do you understand this? And uh, he goes, I don't, I don't know what they're talking about. And I opened it up and I'm like, oh yeah, I know exactly what he's saying because I just connected with the client more and uh, yeah. So I know both of your studios, studios have a focus on more purpose-driven or at least not evil clients. How do you attract those kinds of clients? Where do you find your clients? Johnny, do you have an answer to that one? Yeah. Um, so we, we always think that putting your values like front and center and being, uh, you know, using your voice and, and being open about that is a really good thing. Uh, it doesn't matter what your values are. Um, I mean, unless your values are really evil, then uh, just shut up. But um, other than that, um, the uh, uh, we put it on our homepage of our website, um, and uh, so like clients come, and you know, we we don't we don't hear from a lot of clients that don't align with us because you know they they come to the site and they're, and they're you know we assume that they're like oh okay yeah this is too a little bit too hippy dippy for me. Uh, you know, eco environmental stuff, um, all pass. And, uh, and so like that, you know, just weeds out those types of clients for us. Mm -hmm. And I think like what, you know, uh, there's a, a lot of different ways to do it. That's for us. And, uh, that's the way we do it. And for like, um, Todd Lucian is probably more on sharing on Instagram and like, you know, voicing their opinions on social media. You guys want to speak to that? Lucian, you want to drive? Yeah. And I mean, we believe that like we try to only work with people that will bring like we only, you know, good clients bring good clients, bad clients bring bad clients. So, you know, if we ever work with a client that is not aligned with our values, you know, we'll probably just get more shitty clients from them. So we try super hard to only work with people that we like what we like them as people and we like their businesses. And then that generally leads to more work similar good karma sphere 
And yeah, those things you can do like register as a B Corp and like Johnny was saying, communicate these things. We definitely always have sort of self-initiated projects that mostly appear on Instagram feed or we're definitely sharing our views and opinions and that attracts people and clients on its own as well. And, and to add to that, like our general aesthetic sensibility most often attracts folks that are similarly values aligned. Occasionally it seems like that was the case and we find out that it wasn't. Um, but just the way the work looks and feels to some degree uh, pulls, pulls some of those some of those people and attracts them at least. And then uh, to add to that, just having done this a long time, we know a lot of folks and we've worked with a lot of people. I mean, I'm like, I'm going back to like late 96, early 97. So it's a lot of fucking years in the game. Um, so every once in a while, you know, we hear from, from someone from the past, but those, those connections are, are lasting and often turn into future work again. Right. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, is it true that the Lucian we see on the video chat is actually a clone and that the real Lucian is in a bunker in Ukraine trying to clone Todd, but the experiments are going horribly wrong and the clone Todds keep melting? That's a real question. That's a real question. <laughs> awesome. It wasn't us. I obviously cannot answer that question. <laughs> I really, I really wish it were true. It sounds way cooler than just <laughs> paradigm. <laughs> so, you know, how has this kind of new strange reality affected your studio? Like you were saying, Todd, it was so sad when you were talking about normally working 18 inches from, you know, Lucian. That's not happening now. How has this new weird reality change I'm, I'm obviously in our studio right now Lucian's running a like <clears throat> mini deep fake but uh <clears throat> I you know I I miss it I, I love our studio like uh it really caters to how our, our practice works most optimally and it's an inspiring place to be and to collaborate but on the same regard like I'm, I can't complain like our lives have been very minimally impacted fortuitously we still have enough work um, we're certainly constantly hustling and, and looking for new projects that we're interested in and we've also worked remotely with a big team at one point like back when we were doing Ello, we had 55 people at one point and Lucian and I were largely co-running that team remote even though we were we were in Boulder dozen people between the two coasts, 30 plus people in Denver at one point, 10 or 11 people here. So we have quite a bit of experience working remote and Nick, our assistant designer, uh, we brought on during the hello time period. So he adjusted to that. So for us to switch gears and like Lucian's at home, I'm at home, Nick's at home was a bummer, but no, no big deal, frankly. We're just like, yeah, really lucky. How about you? I think in the, in the grand scheme of things, compared with a lot of other people, we have it very easy. Um, it's, uh, we started the business remote. Um, I was in Minnesota and Johnny was in Arizona. So the first year and a half cast iron design uh, was, you know, just Skype. We would just keep the Skype audio open. We just hear the clicking and typing and then, um, you know, say, hey, hey uh, check out my screen real quick. You know, when I, whenever you had something to look at and, uh, and we just kind of got like we kind of are starting to get like back into that and remember how that felt and like uh, you know just little things like just knowing that you can just say something like if you have the audio open um, you don't have to like ping them on slack or whatever um, just keeps at least it keeps me focused and, and uh, you know stops me from getting distracted and that kind of thing which is a little bit easier when you're not in the office but, uh, right yeah, yeah it's pretty smooth for us and, and we're we're thinking of always like uh, thinking about our clients because they're the people that are really fucked compared to us like you know we're, we work with a lot of people in the service industry as I know Todd and Lucian do as well and, and uh, you know we got um, restaurants and cafes and breweries and and um, we're, we're kind of scrambling to, to help out those people in any way we can and uh, you know they're like we've had some some 
pretty downer conversations, you know, about the reality of the situation with our clients. And, and yeah, just again, kind of reinforces like how lucky we are to be in the position we are and uh, feeling really fortunate and, you know, trying to help people that are, are less fortunate. And on that note, I want to mention that there's probably a lot of other designers in the chat that kind of can relate to that. Um, and they're kind of wondering what they can do. And one thing we've been doing is just emailing our clients and just saying like, Hey, is there any, anything you could, you know, we've, we've got a little bit extra time. Some of our projects have been, you know, like extended or delayed. Um, is there anything you guys could use a few hours of our help with um, to help you guys out with this time Any Instagram ads or, you know, like campaigns or anything like that. So um, it, we've actually gotten a few people with ideas coming back to us. So, um, you know, it's just a way to help out. One more thought on that is like, hopefully everyone on this call knows that like none of us are saving fucking lives right and we're not really taking any real risks we're just doing graphic design so everyone should be super thankful whether they have a lot of work or a little bit of work that uh the position we find ourselves in in this current pandemic are very fortuitous if you're tuned into this zoom just hang out listening to us talk about like our studios you know I'm, I only bring that up because I have to constantly remind myself how fortunate I feel. Yeah. We'll say in this climate, our art has basically stopped. That is something that while we can do design remotely with each other and share our screens and talk, uh, the art making is way more physical. So we haven't figured out how to make any real art during this other than like posters and things, but not a, uh, no paintings or sculptures or anything. Yeah, and our studio being in Lu at Lu our art studio is the lower level of Lucian's house. So we've fully socially distanced and in essence quarantined, even though we've been in and out of the studio independently. I'm not going over there. He's not coming over to my place. I happen to have a immunocompromised uh, family member at home. My mother-in-law is with us. And so we're taking extra precautions to make sure uh, you know, we don't do her any harm. Thanks guys, great points there. So shifting gears again to talk a little bit about inspiration and where you find it. You know, you guys chose 420 as the date for your event um, and you both worked on hemp and cannabis, cannabis brands. This is Colorado after all. I'm curious if, if uh, you know, being high is a part of your creative process at times. If you'd rather not answer that, where do you find inspiration? I'm happy to answer that, Johnny, unless you want to take it first. Nope, go for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do consume marijuana products uh, in very moderated quantities. There goes uh, your political opportunities. <laughs> what's that? There goes your political opportunities. Yeah, totally. Uh, you know on and off, largely on for a great many years. Uh, just like I think one takes vitamins or drinks orange juice, uh, very, you know, with the, the way the marijuana industry has evolved, like personally, I consume super high CBD, low THC types of things that uh, are very inspiring and work for me creatively and keep me calm and, and chill and let me think more clearly. Uh, not during the typical work day, but in between and at times if I'm working late or need a creative jolt. I've, I've got a system between an espresso or two and uh, some cannabis-based substances that can change the game, I believe. Um, but that's a you know, personal experimentation sort of thing. And we do have quite a few clients in the uh, cannabis space uh, between CBD and THC, we're, we're hopefully about to get into a, a bigger cannabis project here in the coming weeks. So um, I'm a believer and uh, I also like the hemp side of the business industry for uh, ecological reasons and just supporting uh, regenerative farming in general. Everyone we work with by and large is uh, really focused on regenerative ag and very environmentally conscious, which is something I think 
a lot of people that don't work in the industry might not know that most folks that do work in the mar marijuana industry are are pretty environmentally conscious and, and focused on improving the earth or at least keeping it as best possible. How about you guys at uh, Cast Iron? Any comments on your where you find inspiration? Um, no, I mean, uh, occasionally it'll put me in the right uh, headspace just to be thinking about a problem differently, but um, no, it's not, uh, it's not a part of our daily practice at all. Uh, I mean, although I do have my, um, uh, my weed socks on, um, that's always, you know, puts me in the right zone mentally um, without cannabis, just like, you know, uh, but yeah, not a, not a huge part, um, yeah. but it uh, can be a useful tool to, yeah, kind of get out of your rut. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I could, I could see how it could be useful for certain people like certain mindsets and that kind of thing but I think I would say most of us here like we approach creativity with from a very analytical side of our brain um, and at least for me it's uh, the I, I like staying in like the very analytical logical side of my brain is where all my creative energy comes from so if, if, if I'm partaking in something like that it's going to be more to like take a break from the creative process and the business stuff um, and kind of like just play video games or watch movies or something. I think there's a lot of misconceptions too about marijuana still as the industry is evolving. Like, you know, most folks, frankly, are going out to like buy weed to get blaze. Um, but marijuana is grown and, and cultivated on like a spectrum now uh, to assist with all sorts of ailments and to sort of change one's mental state in all sorts of incremental ways, if you experiment enough and know what to look for and, and figure that out. So, um, I mean, it's been a long time since I've been stoned, but I use marijuana regularly. Definitely not not to get stoned. I mean, in general, I'm just a pretty jack like person. So it's more of a thoughtful set of it, I guess, to kind of conclude yeah. that chapter. For most people, like three or four days isn't that long of a time, though. Um, you know, Todd, no, I'm joking. <laughs> weekend to weekend. <laughs> but did you want to act? Did you want to know about where we can draw influence from otherwise? Was that part yeah. of the question? Yeah, no, I, I'm actually really curious about that. And I'm sure everyone else is, is too. I was, I was curious what you said, Richard, about you approach things in a more analytical way. Um, you know, maybe more of a problem solving approach to design. Um, but then how do you come up with ideas that are, that feel different, that haven't, that are unexpected if you're in that problem solving state of mind? You, you find a, uh, you find the weird problem that, that is unexpected. You'd like, that's, I think that's like the main thing that can lead to something original is to find an original problem. So you, you try to dig that out of your client. You, you try to, if they say like, hey, what's your value proposition? And they, and it's not specific enough, not unique enough, um, then you have to keep prodding them until you find that one thing where they're like, okay, I've got, uh, I had an uncle that had three legs. And then, then you can say like, all right, let's, let's draw inspiration from there or something like that. Yeah. So do you spend a lot of time in that upfront phase then with the discovery work with clients? How much of your work up front is conversation versus you know sort of diving into solutions um it's about a third of the process about 50 hours these days just for like a new brand uh, before we start doing any design work how about for you guys lucian would you say that that kind of upfront part of your work what percentage of the work is it um Almost, yeah, almost all our time is up front, and that seems to just keep increasing. Um, we typically, the, uh, the solution normally is in maybe the first meeting, but definitely in the briefing and going over that with the client. And then all our work is just mostly conversations between the two of us or us and the client, a little bit of sketching, we really don't get on the computer until we're ready to execute what we believe could be the solution. Mm -hmm. So we're not really just like making rounds after rounds of things that look cool on the computer. We've already sort of figured out the concept, figured out the angle, and then we make it. And then we spend like 
four times that amount of time making the presentation on how we're actually gonna present and show our thinking back to the client. Interesting. Can I clarify something on the inspiration question? And can yeah, you, sure. Can you okay. restate then, it, Amy, the way, the way you initially did? Say that again. Minus the marijuana part. I'm sorry, can you ask that again? I missed what you said. Can you restate the component of the question that was focused on inspiration minus the marijuana part? Yeah, I was just curious about, well, originally what Richard said, um, you know, his insight that both your studios are quite analytical or, you know, sort of lean into design thinking. And I was curious where you find inspiration, especially if your process is so analytical. How do you yeah, cool. have a solution that's, that's original uh, in that frame of mind? Yeah, and I, I just want to elaborate like that the, the weed's not like the inspiration source, right? Like it's just, it's one thing to change one state and to pause and look at the world and experience it differently. So I, as I've gotten older, like my inspiration rarely comes from other people's work or I love looking at it. I look at tons of work in, in certain windows and then I look at no, no work by anyone else just to be in my own head. But it's more about just stopping to think about what's really happening around you, how you're really seeing the world right now and how you could see it, how it could look different. Um, and, and that sort of level of imagining that possibility to bring back to, you know, what Lucian alleged is like where our process starts. And so from the brief and very early on, uh, I, I don't even know if it's inspiration per se, but we just have a process that begins to yield visions of what things could be from stopping to look at uh, things from a, ver a variety of multitude of angles. And that's a, it's another really cool beneficial component of being a duo. Lucia and I share a lot of similarities and then we have, we're quite different in, in numerous ways. And we often look at things from, from very different angles. And then the place that we find to overlap typically tends to be a good place. That's great. So it's just after four. I think we should switch to um, some of our attendees questions. So Nelson's gonna take over here and do you wanna explain how this is gonna work, Nelson? Yeah, um, so it looks like we have a handful of questions. Um, so for those people that do have a question, um, I'll call your name and then we'll switch you over to video and I'll mute you so you can ask a question. Um, and then, so when we do that, there's gonna be like a slight delay in your feed. But once it switches over, you can ask your question. Cool. So I wanna add, uh, yeah. there's, a little, there's a little thumbs up button next to the question. So in order for us to be able to see which questions you guys are all curious about most, hit, hit the thumbs up. Can, wait, can yeah, only- Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can only panelists hit the thumbs up or can everybody hit the thumbs up? I think everyone can. Okay, so yeah, upvote some shit um, so we can see what uh, what we should answer and add, add more questions too if you have some burning ones. There seems to be one really burning one, so let's go to that one. <laughs> Unintended. <laughs> all right, Daniel, uh, we'll all have you ask your question. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Do you want me to say the, the question out loud? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, Daniel, Dan, Dan's a, All right. an awesome speaker. Too, I think so. Todd already, I think Todd already kind of, I think you guys already kind of went through it, but it was just me being snarky, saying hello. And uh, Dan, hi Dan. Hi Bridger, where it's at. <laughs> right on. So the question is Indica or Sativa? I'll say hybrid. <laughs> I actually watched that uh, that Netflix uh, thing about cannabis, and um, they explained that the whole indica and sativa designation is kind of BS. And uh, so I'm gonna have to um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say neither. It's any good if, idea. if you're trying, if you're just like, as far as like what effects you're searching for, like the ones typically prescribed to those. How about how about if you just think of it that way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say the sativa in that case. 
Speaking from a historical point of reference, I have to differ with Johnny, but there is a distinct difference. Uh, and that comes from like having a cultivation perspective long before this stuff was legal. Yeah, but the, the, the whole designation is, is like looking at plants and deciding, oh, does this look like an indica or does it look like a sativa? And if, uh, and then that's how they decide. I think that's the lay designation, but the genetics kind of. Yeah. Hey, there, there's clearly some, some that have different sure. effects than yeah, others, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whether it's like easy to, to like separate them that quickly. Is... Yeah, it's just the, uh, not black and white like, uh, like yeah. I thought it was. Fair enough. All right, should we move to the next question? Yeah, next question. Oh, <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. One, Dan. That was very enlightening. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the next one will be from Hans. Dang, you guys, you guys want some drama. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Hans. Hi, all right. Um, yeah, my question is, what is the nastiest, bloodiest disagreement you guys have ever had? And bonus points, you say, who won? <laughs> <laughs> is there anyone in particular you'd like to answer that question, Hans? Whoever thinks they have the best disagreement that they won. Lucian's probably got a longer, fresher roster of nasty disagreements than me. Yeah, same. Richard, Richard will be the person to answer this question. See, I can't remember. And the way I've thought about this before is I feel like we, we rarely have like a full like blow up. It's more like, uh, you know, microaggressions and micro arguments <laughs> over the dumbest shit. Like, you know, should this be a double story A or a single story? Like, or like what, what image should be first in the Instagram slideshow? <laughs> like shit like that can get real heated. <laughs> Typically, it's just because I'm hungry. So if I eat like a cookie, uh, it's all good. But we have a rule where best idea wins. So if there ever is a disagreement, uh, we just have to both explain our sides and agree. We never leave it like, we, I don't think we've ever had something unresolved. Someone's initially like, yeah, okay, I get it. I, that is That is correct. So I can't think of any like, bangers off the top of my head which is a i really out. don't yell at people but i, I do yell at todd it's the only yeah I'm, Hans, I'm gonna i'm gonna think about it it's a good question to come up with one but the lucian point where like mature enough adults at least and and uh, and this relationship his and mine is perhaps easier than our relationship with our partners where sort of things may drag on for days we tend to resolve things in a fairly short window half a day we're really pissed um I, and I, I feel fortunate and I, my wife hates this. I say this all the time that my business relationship is just frankly so much easier than my relationship at home uh, because of our ability to sort of see things from the same perspective and eventually yield to the more logical, uh, more rational sort of thought as it relates to the, the given subject. When, we, when it becomes a matter of aesthetics, it can get tricky. Uh, but you know, when it, when it gets into our art and we're arguing over something super subjective, like there's an invisible fucking grid behind the painting and I want the margins to be a quarter inch wider than Lucian, eventually someone makes an argument that's strong enough because they just feel compelled that it needs to be spaced like that, that the other one's like, fuck it, if it's that important, fine. Um, but, uh, yeah, Johnny, why don't you and Richard try to throw something out? I'm going to try to think of one. I got like five, like just off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say before Richard answers, uh, Hans is looking for something juicy, you guys. You gave him one of those yeah, 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 bullshit yeah. unanswers. Ju Richard's going to lay down the juicy stuff. Go for it. Um, okay, let's see. Well, I'll start off with like some of the, the like the, the less juicy, like the funnier stuff, I think. Uh, we used to like, uh, we used to live and work together in the same house. Um, so that, that got contentious every once in a while. I mean, overall, like you spend like uh, 12 hours a day with someone every single day um, for many years. Um, and you only have like a few really heated arguments here and there. It's a pretty good sign. Um, but you know, it's going to happen. Um, we used to have to, uh, we used to have to label our, uh, like our maple syrup jars separately. Uh, Cause Johnny would use about two to three times as much syrup 
per pancake as me. And we were not normal ratio as we we agreed. <laughs> uh, we didn't uh, have a lot of money at the time. Let's just say that. Uh, so there would be a lot of arguments about like uh, uh, like you know grocery shopping and like Johnny wanted the fancy almond butter uh, stuff, and I was like, well, you eat, you're gonna eat three quarters of this jar because you are obsessed with it. Um, so there's all this weird stuff like that and splitting the bill and that kind of thing. Um, but I'd say more recently, I think um, it's more, it's a lot of times it's just about um, reacting uh, to people's ideas, like unenthusiastically, like, you know, sometimes Johnny will be like uh, just hyped on some random like idea he had like late at night. Um, he'll text me at like 11 PM with this idea. And I just, I'm, I'm not really into it, <laughs> you know? And it's like, maybe he can justify it and like walk me through it. And then most of the time, if he's excited about something, eventually I'll get excited about it, but he has to like sell it to me sometimes. Right. Um, it's pretty normal. And but you know, when you're in the office, you can go through that process, but I cannot stand having long drawn out text conversations. So, um, I, you know, I used to, I used to say things like very dismissive and I've had to like uh, find nicer ways to, uh, to basically say like, just like, Hey, that's interesting. Let's talk about it more tomorrow rather than being like, eh, you know, like that kind of thing. So I'll, I'll share two that I know were fights, but one worked out poorly and one worked out, I think, well, um, and, and there's just not a lot, so it's hard, but one goes back, like, these are just a couple that come to mind, I guess, because they're things I, well, this one I own in a way I'm not happy about. But it was, I think it was the day of we were presenting an identity system that was like super fucking dope and should be out in the world today. It was the day of or the day before. <laughs> we can recall this. And I, I have am still pissed about this, actually. I, <laughs> happen, <laughs> I happen to reference some other work by a respected international designer that wasn't at all a reference wasn't intended to be derivative. I don't even know if we'd seen it prior to doing this work. And I was like, fuck, it's too similar. It's, it's, it's taking off on too big of a scale and it's too similar to what we're about to show the client. And the client was already liking the work. So even though we like it and they like it, we need to tell them that like, we have to go in another direction. Um, and it's funny because I had enough experience at the time to know better, but I almost was some like component of just ego and like stat awareness of like relations in the larger design world that I didn't want us to be lumped in a bucket as being said, we copied this to do this when we did it. Um, but it really didn't matter in the bigger scheme of things because the brand we were working on was so much bigger and it wasn't derivative. Anyways, I fucked up the whole thing. I told the client, you know, we found this other thing. It's, it's too similar. We think we need to change it. There's going to perhaps could be criticism, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they got bummed out and, and left and moved on and the project ended and they went to be, went on to be a huge fucking company. Uh, and the, and they were super cool and they would have loved to keep working with us, but uh, I handled that one poorly. Another one, uh, and I'm not going to name names, clients, but uh, was like we had an identity system done. I think we were presenting it that day or the next morning. I don't even know if Lucian will remember who I'm talking about because I'm going to talk about it loosely. And then I was like, no, the types, it was a word mark and the type's not right. And I'm like, we need to design a new typeface, none of the typefaces are working. And then he got super pissed at me and went home. And between the two of us, we designed a new typeface that night and made the word mark and then had the presentation that day and the client loved it. It's fucking great, but it was super stressful. Just up until that point, I thought the work was good and then woke up that morning and was like, no, it's not good enough for what it could be. And, and so, you know, it turned into a late night of redoing it all and maybe it could have been fine. So we have shit like that that comes up, right? I mean, it's not a, nothing major, but we do get pissed at each other in those moments and sometimes rightfully so. We, we always say that the partnership is a lot like a marriage. Um, yeah, I agree for us, it's a lot easier like than any sort of romantic relationship that we've been in. And, uh, but 
but it, it still it has the ups and downs and trials and tribulations that you know one would expect and uh yeah you just gotta work through it and yeah as we get older i'm sure it's the same with you guys like our like when we first started richard said he, he looked back at our emails the other day and he was like man we were really dicks to each other in the beginning <laughs> and like as we like you know we, we started there's tons of arguments and then like as time goes on it's just like lower and lower and lower and you know to the point where it's like everything's like resolved within 10 minutes now and everything's really quick um, yeah we used to spend like an hour writing three sentences in some emails yeah. just arguing about the tiniest tiniest discrepancies in how we want to word things um yeah and we, we probably argued two or three times a day when we were first starting out about something. i just want to share one more thought it's sort of related but not really and it might not come up in the questions but yeah there's a beauty in the like fact that neither of us can recall a like knockdown blowout right and uh in the larger context of my life personally my wife my son lucian our partnership my dog there's like a handful of things in there that i'm like proud of being able to cultivate and manage those relationships and they're really significant parts of my life and my relationship with Lucian outside of my relationship with my mother and sister and, and extended family is like, the, you know, one of the longest and arguably even richer, richest relationships in, in my life. So it's a, it's a great, you know, pleasure and opportunity to have a partner and to go through these trials and, and tribulations and navigate that shit and support one another through it uh, for the sake of like mutual respect of one another and, and moving forward creatively and maintaining our practice together, which is a unique, rare, and I think special thing. All right, let's uh, move on to another question. Thanks, Hans. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so um, the next one is going to be from Emily. It's a good question. <laughs> hey, Emily. All right. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, so my question is, um, how can um, recent graduates or even just young designers um, navigate the COVID world, whether we're just graduating or um, do things to kind of set us apart when people start hiring again um, and uh, the impact like opportunities we could have in our community like what are some of those things that we can start doing now uh, I wanted to say before you, we answer um, Emily throw your uh, portfolio in the chat um, uh, if you don't if, Emily, do you have, uh, people should be looking at um, Emily's work she's great she's a, a, a excellent designer and um, yeah I wanted to say that, but uh, yeah, so for us, uh, the, I think the most important part is to, you know, make sure it's, uh, you're turning it into an opportunity um, and uh, not seeing it as like, you know, um, uh, a negative and uh, to, to like use the time. We're actually going to start a series, I think next week, um, about how to like improve your portfolio because we've seen, you know, looked at a lot of portfolios and um, we, uh, you know, we think that every single person no matter how good your portfolio is has room to improve theirs and this is you have a ton of time to like go through dial in all of your projects and um you know once the economy picks back up and people start hiring again and you know everything's kind of um moving along then you'll be in a much better position than anybody else uh because you know you um double down on your portfolio and and uh didn't you know watch too much netflix you gotta watch some netflix just not too much yeah, we could kind of group this in with the Jess's question about designers that have just been furloughed. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, because I think that you kind of have to like see it like you, when the stock market's down, that's when you should invest in that kind of thing. So, so yeah, you should be um, using your, your, your extra time to, to um, separate yourself, improve your portfolio, take your good projects um, and add, add more to them. You know, um, maybe even uh, go back and, and fix them. There's no law against going in to your old, your old case studies and, and expanding on them, uh, especially if you're a student and student work and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, what else was I going to say? 
uh, oh yeah, um, we started our business during like the, basically the peak of the last recession. Um, I think there's something to say about being young, um, being a little bit cheaper and just, you know, that's kind of how it works. Um, there's an opportunity, you know, when the economy's down and people are a little bit scared about making huge investments, um, people are going to be looking uh, more, more willing to take a risk on younger, newer designers, I think. So, um, yeah, I think that in the way that kind of helped us get our start is by, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that were like, Hey, can we find, you know, do we have to hire this huge agency to do some work or can we find someone smaller, someone that's just getting started? Um, hey, that's good advice. Can I add a couple things? And they're like sort of COVID specific. So lots of people need help right now. Like most of us in this chat on this call probably don't know too many of them who are in like more fortunate circumstances, but putting out a call to like see who you can help and in graphic design is one of the ways you can help from afar. Like you don't have to be around someone. You don't have to worry about getting someone sick or getting sick. So volunteering, working, you know, inexpensively, but you can reach out to orgs, individuals, different entities and just say, hey, I want to help at a super reduced rate or I can volunteer or I can donate my time. I think other things that are important creatively are to document what you're seeing and feeling and thinking right now as artifacts that could turn into portfolio projects, whether that's posters or photos or writing. I mean, it's all, it's all design related and uh, it's important to document history and share your perspective. And um, just be like extra cool to people reach out and and like be thoughtful and be considerate and again see if there's ways to help we're volunteering on a big project right now that's eating fucking shitload of time that we could be using to make money but we think it's important and we know it's important we're, we're doing a bunch of work for governor polis's office on a new website to respond to that's in response to the covid scenario that is going to be full of financial resources, facts and financial resources for small businesses across the state of Colorado from minority owned businesses, rural businesses, uh, female owned businesses, larger businesses, folks in the tech community, it's going to become like a one stop shop to get COVID related information around loans and uh, financial assistance, aids, grants, etc. Um, so doing that stuff Obviously, if you need money, you have to make money, but uh, finding ways to do that. And so we're just doing that because it's, it's cool and it's something we can help with and all the people involved are really cool. Um, but it's hard. Like I'm, I'm getting up at 730 right now in the morning for a stand up for a volunteer project every day for at least, you know, two weeks into that. And, uh, and Lucian, Nick and I are, are, are working on that project on other, other time that could be billable. So you know, just think about who you, who you can help and try to help where it has an impact. And then you can turn that stuff into portfolio work per Richard and Johnny's thoughts and, and bolster your portfolio. Yeah, good, good thoughts. Cool. I think that's a, you know, our time is, is nearly up and I think that's a great note to end on um, unless any of the panelists have anything else they'd like to share or Nelson has a question. I want to answer Lisa's question. Uh, if you okay. could choose your dream project that you've not done yet, because we want to put this out in the world uh, so that people, uh, you know, spread the word and we get it eventually. Um, we want to do uh, movie props for a, um, uh, like, a, uh, ideally, you know, something like a Wes Anderson movie or a Paul Thomas Anderson movie or, um, you know, uh, any Anderson really, no. Uh, like Jones. <laughs> Mike Jones, um, yeah, just uh, we want to do a, a full on, like I, ideally a space movie, I think would be the coolest because we'd fucking crush that. Um, but we'll take any movie, it doesn't matter. Um, we just want to do the like the full on the props, all that. Nice. Hey, unless we have to go, like I see a couple more interesting questions. Uh, but Lucian, if you wanted to respond to that one as well. Uh, yeah, Dream Project. I don't, we don't like have one queued up like on demand like Richard and Johnny, but I think in general, we love, I think most designers like projects where you actually get to make things. And in some ways, the bigger, the better. So some of the like big checklists are like massive transportation projects 
like trains, like we want to brand, a, you know, a train or uh, airplanes. It'd be nice if those were more environmentally, like it was a new super eco train, that would be even better. But, you know, big wayfinding projects, airports, you know, logos on the sides of real things that are big and moving around is always kind of juicy for us. Well, the, the richer and more complex the requirements of the system, the more intriguing the project is. So we can kind of apply that to a lot of things that get sexy fast. Nelson, do you see another question you think that uh, you want Rob to Rob has an interesting question. I don't know if you saw that one, Nelson. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, let, me, uh, let me bring Rob on if he's still there. Let's see. Yeah, let's see his face. Come on, Rob. If he'll show it. Right now, can he turn on his video? Rob. Try Rob. to turn on your video. Oh, Rob. he's in stealth mode. Come on, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Nice, freshly backward. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Rob? So, yeah, thank you. Um, here, let me find my question. Um, yeah, so my question is basically uh, how tech, not uh, like basically big tech culture. Specifically, their processes, methods, uh, methods, workflows, timelines, and obviously financing being a big one, has changed the practice. And how do you manage those relationships without compromising your own process and methodology in the process? In, in the uh, as a result, so this is like like that question. Rob gets at like sort of the immediate past, the present, and the post-corona future. I think in some in some really interesting ways and just brings me to a point I thought about earlier in the conversation and lost track that one of the outcomes I think of the current situation we're finding ourselves in is that people that otherwise aren't that chill are like being forced to chill out a little bit and and I think that the sort of cultural tenor that's going to arise out of this I'm hoping is one that's a bit more relaxed Whereas the pressures that tech historically has put on the design industry were initially the opposite, uh, but then there's sort of like enclaves and pockets of like super slow, relaxed work with scale because like some of these giant Googles, Twitters, Facebooks can afford to, you know, take three months to design an interface experience that a smaller company who's adopted a more stereotypically current relevant tech model of, of processing and operating is like, we have to design that experience in a week. Whether they do or not, the feeling is they have to design it in a week. So I think in the most recent past that tech culture by and large has like pushed people towards wanting more for less, moving faster um, and uh, by and large, I feel like has brought a less thoughtful approach to the design world as a whole. But I, I think on some levels with grand scale over time, even in the immediate present, the Googles, Twitters, again, they've bought themselves a certain thoughtfulness. So if you're working at that corporate scale where there's enough revenue, there's enough profit coming in that you can afford to consider every little itty bitty thing. It's really ironic, right? Because those people are now the most thoughtful about design and everyone trying to become one of those is arguably the least thoughtful, just trying to move as fast as possible and break shit and disrupt and get stuff out the door. Um, you know, and so we, for the most part, try to stay away from anything that's too, too fast and, and sort of uh, improperly scoped, but we'll also move fast at times, but it's, I think it's largely had a negative impact on the industry that right now is going to correct to some degree. Uh, the, the current situation we find ourselves in, I think the byproduct of that is slowing down. Just on the way to the studio today, I was talking to a friend who's running a big build out, a contracting project, and he's like, it's really cool, man. I can only have one like team of craftspeople in here at a time just to be thoughtful right now. So like the plumbers are in there and they're in there for a week and a half and then the electricians are going to come back in. And then the floor guys are going to come back in and then the, whoever's going to come back in. But, you know, six weeks ago, fucking everyone would be in there in the same week to try to do the shit as fast as possible, stepping on each other's shit and moving cables and moving materials. And we just can't do that 
right now. And I find, I find that interesting. I think that's, that force slowing down, I think is going to be valuable and bring a certain thoughtfulness to lots of things, uh, hopefully to our work and practice in general. Sorry, I rambled on your, your question, uh, opened a lot of doors. Anyone else want to add to that? I think I one other good. thing is, oh, go ahead, Richard. We, no, we no, used our time. I say, Todd I used our time. Let me just do it. <laughs> okay, I was just going to say, because we have a unique, you know, background that we, fortunately or unfortunately, we made a startup. So we sort of lived that life for five years. And so now being post startup, I think, you know, promoting and showing your process as in contrast to theirs has an opportunity. And since we know their process and what they're trying to achieve and how they're used to working so well, you know, being from the outside and saying, you know, let us look at your business sort of in a different way, pull you out of your normal routine and sort of force you into our process. Sometimes they can appreciate that because it, you know, changes up their own cadence. So I think trying to approach it as like understanding, we know this isn't how you normally go about it. We know how you do normally go about it. And we think it's beneficial if we actually follow our process and this is why I think that's the opportunity. And that was a much better, more succinct, less abstract <laughs> answer. But yeah, having, having the experience of played the startup game and like we've read all the books. I'm, I'm looking at a pile of startup books over here and there's some good shit in there. And there's sort of a tried and true process to like take a company from zero to hero and 99% fail and 1% make it, right? Uh, the reason 99% fail and 1% make it is because that process is fucked. So we have the perspective of being part of that process now and we can look at it and bring a richer, I feel like deeper perspective to it. And so when we're working with clients in those spaces that have read all those books and are hearing, adhering to the process that made Google, Google, right? For every one Google, there's just, you know, a, a litany of, of busted folks trying to be a Google. So it's valuable to understand the processes and workflows that a lot of our clients are adopting and adhering to and then to come in and it's a word we don't use a lot but dis disrupt those in hopefully thoughtful uh new ways yeah i think that's a, i mean i'm satisfied with that answer i don't know if johnny or richard if you guys <laughs> had anything being kind of a different perspective uh different background slightly well, they, they touched on everything at least for me um yeah uh less money faster timelines um yeah it's just kind of uh we turned down almost all of it uh because of that um and uh, but occasionally we get some good startup clients that um you know that are the right fit and we're excited to work with them and uh it goes really well when it goes well um we, when we take those projects on but yeah it's usually disappointing because they'll be like hey we need this finished in six weeks so like we could start in eight weeks and then that's it yeah it, it also gets into a different question that i don't want i won't go too deep on but just about design bios which is something we talk about a lot that like your average startup kids like have never bought design so they don't understand the process they don't know how it's supposed to go and they particularly haven't bought design from good or experienced designers so, you know, working in a, working with startup people that have exited two or three or four times is very different than working with someone that's on their first startup, you know, uh, but that, can't, that relates to buying design in general in a, in a bigger way. Perfect. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Rob. Nice see you. Hey, good to see you. See you can we do some, like, can we just try to do some lightning round, just answer a bunch of these really quickly? Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. I'm not allowed to answer then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe we just don't bring people on if you see a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just read them out. Just read them out. Uh, all right. Uh, I like this one. What's a recent change you've made to your design process? Uh, what do you, anything that comes to mind for you guys? We just completely changed our proposal and we did it for a specific project that we did not get. I don't want to say it was because of the new proposal. I think there was a, some other um, outside answers. Yeah, that led. It was like right at the peak. It was a big project, and right at, right at you know the head of this whole situation just kind of went away. But we fully revamped our whole proposal, and I mean we mentioned a little bit. Maybe not everyone knows, but yeah. So we had to start up for five years. We're about two years back during 
those five years, we did zero client work. We were full time working on Ello. So we've had an interesting time that we sort of restarted our studio. And uh, we wish we had all the time and that would also mean all the money in the world to like stop and pause and really thoughtfully address every single process. But we just had to get rolling as fast as possible. So it was nice that we had the opportunity to go back, revise the proposal, or excuse me, yeah, the proposal. So that was a... What about you guys, Johnny, topic. Richard, what do you got? What's changed? I think one thing we've been doing recently that we used to be dead set against is showing uh, in progress work, bringing the client in before we like fully build out the presentation. Um, I feel like uh, it's, it's a beneficial thing if you know how to navigate the waters um, and it takes many years of experience, I think, to like be able to do it properly. But once, once you feel like confident that you can, you can have those conversations with clients and, and you can, and you can make sure that they don't get like off track or they're not like stuck on how it looks now. Uh, and, uh, you trust, you can build that trust. Um, it frees up like a lot of time to just make it better. Cause we, we know like, Hey, we can get buy-in on this idea early we can really devote all our time to that rather than questioning whether or not they'll even be before this concept to begin with. Yeah. I guess one thing related to that, we almost <clears throat> unanimously when we're doing identity work, put forth one identity, pursue that through the whole project. We kind of get buy-in early, like Richard said, show some work to get enough buy-in to move forward. But on larger projects where the budgets are bigger recently, we're coming back to, designing multiple options. Uh, we talk a lot of folks out of it, but sometimes people want to pay. And you know, our, our argument is, one of our arguments around one solution is like, you really want our energy focused and, and distilling in on the best viable solution we can come up with. And if we're going to do three for the same price, all three are going to be weaker. But if we're going to do three for three times the price, all three are going to be really good. As long as we have the time to think them through, they're just going to be different solutions to the same problem. So occasionally we're, we're going down that road, which is new. Yeah. We, we just did a multi, a three, you know, a multi um, direction identity for the first time in like eight years or something. Uh, it was, it was unpleasant. I, I would try to like, <laughs> uh, it was an interesting experiment. Um, it's but hard. there's a reason why we, yeah. We once you've gone it. the other way, it's hard to go that way. Richard, grab it, grab another um all right let's try to think of uh quicker ones uh how important is it to have personal or side projects aside from professional work come on johnny me yeah go go for it johnny um i think uh if you are only coming in you know clocking in at uh, nine and leaving at five or whatever um and then you just go home and you're not doing design anything. That's, that's an okay approach. But I think um, for us doing other creative things outside of um, our day to day is, is uh, really important. And at different times we're like, feel, you know, fired up about different things. Like, you know, Richard was learning to play the piano like uh, a few months ago. Uh, we've always been in and out of photography. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, um, I think it can only just add to your uh, to your arsenal and make you a better designer. So I think I think it's really important. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, don't stress out if if you're not feeling it because there's a lot of periods where we're just you know consuming. It's I think uh, I read something about like um, uh, fuck I can't remember the reference now. It was like um, grazing and digesting. It was like relating it to how a cow does it. Like uh, you know they eat a bunch and then sometimes they just, um, uh, uh, you know, are, are digesting and, and um, like, uh, it's like a back and forth where you're constantly, um, you can be, you know, making shit and just doing stuff. And then sometimes we're just, you know, reading or consuming content and like absorbing it. So um, yeah, I think that's like an important thing that's not always talked about because people will feel bad about, uh, you know, like, oh, I don't have my, I'm not doing my personal project. I'm not like living up to my potential, but you might be doing other things that are feeding you in the same way. Good answer. As long as you don't eat the cow, right? <laughs> don't eat the cow. Yeah. Just basically, you know, follow your heart. 
that's that's a good idea. Yeah, th I think for us, we are always striving. Like our optimal is 50-50. And because we have a sort of client separate work, art. Client work to personal work. Right. And because we have an art practice, a lot of that personal work can be just a straight art. And then, you know, like right now we can't make art, but we're making a ton of other stuff sort of around COVID. We always find that, you know, and I don't think any of this is new to anyone, but in those personal projects, you have the space to experiment and explore. And we always find that those either gets us new work in that vein, or, you know, we develop techniques that always find their way in the project. Yeah, I do think I it's interesting. Because we have our own studios, like, um, I, I could see if I had to work for somebody else and only do what, what work they gave me, I might need to do more like self-initiated stuff. But I feel like we've kind of forged our own path so much that like it kind of feels it kind of fills that void most of the time with what even our client work for me. Yeah, I uh, agree with Lucian. Our optimal balance is fifty fifty. I, we're doing more personal work than ever, and I'm in a phase where I'm actually really doing a lot for me, but I've, I'm reading less and, and designing again more. And I feel like it's like, to Johnny's point, right? You've got to consume and adapt and evolve your thinking to in theory make better work, but then you also have to practice the work like anything. It's a, I have a bit of an athletic background. So I look at graphic design from like a sporting perspective and like, you want to be good, you have to fucking practice. Um, and if you like the thing you do, it should be a pleasure to practice. Um, so, I had a conversation with uh, Timothy Sassenti, which he's a director and makes some wild music videos. And he was saying, you know, every client project where they make a new, whatever it is, a new spot, a music video, he pays everyone that comes out because, you know, film production has a lot of people involved to stay two extra days past whenever the project is done. And they just get as crazy as they can. And that like basically generates all the next work for him. But he takes the time and like takes care of, of everyone that works for him to stay on beyond the project just to, you know, while they're there and have the resources, make some really experimental work. And if you look at his work, you can see it, it just gets kind of crazier and crazier. All right. What is your weakness? Everybody, everybody say your weakness and try to say it like in, in like five words or less. I'll go. I feel like the work's never good enough. Even when I think it's rad, it's like always a notch below. That's one of those, that's one of those, uh, <laughs> like weakness is a strength kind of uh, turnarounds. Like, oh, that's, I mean, that's fine. Cause like, I feel like, uh, I think some people just feel like they fucking hit a home run every time. Right. I'm like, I'm like, God damn. It was like, a B, a B minus. I thought I had a potential there, you know. So it's just, uh, I don't know. It's just, uh, yeah. It could legitimately hurt your, your bottom line. Being self-critical, I guess. Being being self-critical. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly so. That's my superpower is uh, uh, being self-critical. It definitely hurts, but uh, I feel like that's that's like I would never want it any other way. Um, I don't really know what my what, what's my weakness, Richard. Uh, my extreme temper. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, uh, I have to say what your weakness is. I don't know. Uh, stubbornness. I think I think your weakness is being able to like tunnel vision, like getting stuck on one idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think that relates to stubbornness in general. Um, yeah, the uh, uh, just wanting my way and then, you know, trying to fight for it too long and wasting a bunch of time. I would say my weakness is um, foresight, I guess. Like I can't, it's hard for me to envision a completed design or concept in my head. I have to iterate and uh, I have to try like 50 bad designs to get to a good one. Um, so it's, I, a lot of times our, me and Johnny will argue over like, when we're ready to start jumping into Illustrator and thinking around and stuff. And, um, it's because of the, we, he's kind of like, he has a vision instantly and sometimes he gets stuck on that. Um, and, and a lot of times it's really good. Um, 
so it's a positive thing, but uh, it's, there's kind of a conflict there because a lot of times uh, I can't, I don't know if something's good unless I try and look at it. Um, so. um, I don't know, it's hard to pick just one weakness. <laughs> I think I would go with sort of stubbornness, like unyielding, uncompromising. I definitely struggle with that in all aspects of my life. Good right. answer. Well, uh, I think probably a good spot to wrap up. I want, before we end, I wanted to say uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you to um, Amy and Nelson. Nice job, and Michael Cigarella for putting this together. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for, for being willing to do this and for taking time during this odd time to entertain us and inspire us. Um, and I hope we can all be together soon. 2022. Hear from the governor in a day or two what that timing might be. Um, if anybody had any burning questions they didn't get answered, feel free to DM or email. Um, you know, yeah. both, both of us are happy to, you know, we do a lot of lectures and we like to kind of, uh, you know, spread the knowledge and that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's some good questions in there. Sorry we didn't get them all, but thanks, yeah. everyone. Thanks for everybody for showing up too. And you know, around. Listen to us muse about graphic design. Yeah, and I wanted to say, um, if anyone has ideas for programming for AIGA Boulder, please feel free to email me, amy.hayes at aigacolorado.org. And next month, we will resume our Lunch and Learn series online. We're going to have another virtual event, the first and second Friday of May, um, and it's going to be with our AIGA Colorado web chair, Jeremy Tignano. And he's gonna be doing a two session series on, the first one is design systems for digital products. And the second one is gonna be a working session on using Figma, which is a collaborative interface design tool. So we'll post about that soon. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks, thanks everyone. Stay safe and be happy and have fun out there. Bye everybody, thank you. Bye. See ya. Yeah.